I want to give you a little window into what's going on in this space. Uh, I want to emphasize as well, though, that um, the way that this mathematics makes its contributions is through interaction with other contributions. We heard in the previous talk about deep learning and so on. In fact, this this particular interaction began slightly before deep learning really became mainstream. And they've interacted with each other. But I think it's important to understand that I'm not trying to sell you a unique solution that solves everything, but rather a set of insights that come from the mathematics that can often enhance what you're doing in the other context. It interacts well with other ideas from deep learning and from machine learning and modern data science. So it's a team effort. It's always been a team effort. Uh, I'm very fortunate at the moment to have a, a large grant, this data SIG grant. And the theme of this data SIG grant is very much what we've just been talking about, developing the mathematics, but also pushing forward the interactions with other areas. Um, let's move to my second slide. Hopefully that will work. Yeah. So I want to explain today, I want to, if you like, emphasize today that if you want to make progress in applied areas, coupling this with an interaction with and a vibrantly developing pure, more fundamental research has real benefits um, and that neither does as well in isolation as they do when they interact. What is rough path theory? Rough path theory is, in a sense, a generalization of calculus. It was Isaac Newton, I think, I'm not a historian of mathematics, who first understood that you could use calculus. Uh, and one of the things he used it for was to explain interactions between systems. So planets interacting with through gravitation with a body moving and so on. And he wrote wrote down what we would today call controlled differential equations. And they've, of course, been an incredibly useful tool since then. But they have their limitations, and one of their limitations is actually calculus. Fundamental to Newton's ideas, really, was that if you have a path and you want to understand differential equations associated with it, then you need to, and you can, approximate the path by chords, by straight lines, and a piecewise linear approximations do an adequate job of how you make everything work and how you make the connections work. But that system, that methodology, that way of thinking sort of breaks down once you see more complex systems, higher dimensional interactions, Brownian stochastic sort of interactions. The truth is that the piecewise linear approximations to the driving signal are not really adequate to say what's going on. And initially, Ito found a way through that dealt with the borderline case of Brownian motion, um, which is just on the edge, really, when piecewise linear approximations don't really work, but maybe they work with probability one. But rough path theory is about trying to make sense in a good mathematical way of how to model interactions between systems where maybe on some very, very fine scale, it's still smooth. You're not arguing about whether it means anything, but on normal scales, it's highly oscillatory, complicated, like speech. I mean, we communicate with words on a scale of maybe a tenth of a second or half a second, but actually the real signal is very oscillatory and is high frequency inside that. How do you make sense of interactions without tunneling down to the micro scale and following the path in the traditional calculus way. That's really what rough path theory is about. And it develops certain concepts which really go back to certainly the 1950s and in some places the 1930s to geometry and to analysis and pulls those together to get a theory that works. And it in it, we introduce, and we'll mention some of these things later on, some new 
tools, new language for describing the evolution of systems. And about 1914, no, not 19, 2014, um, a young uh, computer scientist slash statistician, Ben Graham, or he, he was young then, um, combined some of these ideas with some early work on deep learning. He was an expert in and a pioneer in sparse convolutional neural nets. And he applied it to a problem he was interested in, which was actually how to analyze online Chinese handwriting. And he, he entered, uh, I guess, the, I can't remember, my, my brain gets worse, but he entered the international every other year competition. And against very fierce competition from other deep learning people, he actually won this competition by mixing state-of-the-art neural nets with state-of-the-art rough path theory. And that got me really interested in the idea that maybe one could use this stuff more systematically to contribute to data science. And, um, well, the Chinese handwriting grew. It was taken over, Ben's ideas were taken over by South China University of Technology. And they built an app for the iPhone and one for the Android, and they were successful, uh, and several million downloads and so on. But finally, it was consumed into um, one of the large uh, companies uh, into the Sogo, I guess. Um, and uh, I think it's possible it's still used today. Certainly for many years, it was on their website acknowledging the contribution of South China University. On a pure side, this same sort of understanding, the ability to understand interactions of complex, of complex evolving systems, um, drew the attention of Martin Hira. In fact, he examined one of my PhD students. And Martin then took it a stage further in his regularity structures and was able to, of course, get a Phillips medal and essentially transform our understanding of uh, stochastic partial differential equations. Um, particularly the ones involving randomly evolving interfaces. So rough path theory is the mathematics needed to explain the interaction between complex systems that are oscillating wildly um, as they evolve. The heart of this mathematics is how you describe the evolving system. You have an evolving system and you need to actually get hold of it in a mathematical way. The way we'd have done it in a mathematics class 20, 30 years ago is probably we'd have thought of it as a function of time. And we, we would just think of this graph in our mind. But this graph is actually a very inefficient and even provably inadequate way of describing a complex and oscillatory system. The trouble is that you can have very fast oscillations and they can happen in almost no space. So in the limit, you can have a path that doesn't move at all, but still has consequences. In other words, that the, the functions you're interested in don't have closed graphs if you want to think of them as being driven by the ordinary path. You needed something different. And rough path theory actually has an answer to that is not going to describe the path or the stream by giving its value at times. As I said, this is provably an inefficient and an ineffective way of doing it. It turns out that it's much more efficient and much more effective to adopt a more top-down approach. And rather than do a microscopic approach, you let the system interact with nonlinear devices. Linear devices will be boring because it's oscillating. It starts at zero, finishes at zero. So a linear device would be zero. But a nonlinear device, that's not at all true. And by understanding how the system interacts with nonlinear devices, it turns out that if you look at the right nonlinear devices, this actually gives you a rich enough picture to work out how it interacts with other nonlinear devices. 
And so it provides an effective top down description of the path. So rather than thinking of it XT, so if you in the language of this differential equation I've just written down, can you see my cursor? I hope you can. This differential equation here is a typical example of how we should think of understanding X. We don't understand X by looking at its value. We understand X by looking at the response Y to letting X interact with Y through a physical system or a mathematical system F. And it's a core cool idea because it actually really does get away from needing to understand the path locally. And there's a mathematical class of Fs, which we call the signature, which are mathematically stereotyped nonlinear systems, specially chosen to extract out the right information about X in order to be able to predict what happens. And it turns out that this description, the signature, and also its logarithm, provide a mathematically sound way of understanding stream data. I say mathematically sound because that's what it is. One of the complexities of stream data, which is often forgotten by people, is actually if you want to understand the stream properly, you're going to pay attention to the order in which things happen. And whereas a one-dimensional stream is very boring, zero, 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 the only only interesting thing there is how many of them. Once you have a two dimensions or more, zero, one, zero, then actually the amount of information that you have explodes exponentially with the length. I mean, the Arabs were extremely clever when they wrote down our number system and used logarithmically many numbers between naught and 10 to describe any number. And it's the same here, that actually, once you go into stream data, if you want to properly understand it, and capture all the information, it is inescapable that the amount of information is exponential. Many methods don't bother to do that, but of course what they're doing is they're actually missing the higher order information. They may count the number of zeros, they may count the number of ones, but they will not be capturing the exact order in which those events happen, and that might well matter. So the signature does capture these things, but at the same time, is therefore an exponentially big object. Now, having said that, it can still be a very useful object in practice and is certainly a useful object conceptually. So actually, one of the advantages of this so-called signature or these family of difference, this family of responses to nonlinear systems is that it's graded. You start with the simplest descriptions and you get progressively more complicated ones and then progressively more complicated ones become more and more faithful but it actually gives you a a way of partially describing information and that's really really important and one of the key things about it one of the reasons it obviously adds value is that it throws away something quite important if i look at the response to that differential equation it actually doesn't care how quickly I move along the path. If I have a path segment, and I'm interested in describing that path segment, that movie, or that piece of text, or that map route, uh, I don't need to know the speed at which I go along it. I only need to know that I, the order in which I did things. This is, well, I'll come back to that, but it actually has lots of really it sounds as if you're throwing away something crucial, but you're not. And it allows lots of advantages. One advantage of this feature set is it's essentially insensitive to how often you, you sample the data. Missing data, irregular data, just not issues. It's a feature set that basically um, allows you to get away immediately from issues of missing data. Missing data is no longer an issue if you want to worry about a piece of data being um, missing, then this is multimodal data and you just add an extra stream and you count the number of times and, uh, and uh, something didn't happen. Um, but many other things happen. So there's a kernel for these objects. Um, and quite remarkably, and this is in some sense referring to the 
round trip. So kernels are obviously useful from a data science perspective. Um, but the interesting thing here is the kernel between these two unparameterized paths is actually obtained by solving a PDE numerically. A PDE that's actually quite easy to do with GPUs and things, and it's quite practical to do. So there's a kernel. It's quite, it's, quite, it's quite a trick. And I'm going to spend some time trying to explain to you more why it's a good idea. And the plan of this talk essentially is after that, I'm going to try and give you some quick overview of the different directions it's having genuine applications. So what, one of the things I just explained to you is that we take a stream and from this stream, we produce a series of numbers, which is the response to these nonlinear systems, a series of features, if you like, that collectively describe the unparameterized path, but are graded so that you have a top-down description. You don't need to tunnel into the finest oscillations ever. But a consequence of it being a vector is that you can take the expected signature. Now, in general, taking the expectation of something doesn't necessarily tell you a great deal about the something. But this is one of those ex examples, like Laplace transform, where by taking the expected signature, you actually, to a certain extent, a precise mathematical extent, recover the, dis the distribution. So if you have a random <clears throat> path, stream or if you have an ensemble of streams and that happens really very often where you don't have a single path but you have a crowd of paths then not only does the signature describe the individual trajectories the expected signature describes the collection of trajectories and this actually is very flexible and allows one to look at all sorts of fairly complex stream data uh, to give a, a an in Interesting and complex example. If you have, if you think about um, uh, the genetic diversity in a tumor, well, when the tumor starts, there's a single cell. As it grows, the cells, of course, split. So you get a tree of genetic diversity, but then you actually also get some. Um, mutations in some of these. So finally, at the top, when you're trying to understand the tumor, if you do biopsies, you can actually see a tree of genetic diversity coming in. That sort of example can be relatively easily modeled using expected signatures. Um, it's a remarkably flexible thing because of this. Um, and the kernels can be used to deal with high dimensional stuff where you want lots of the features. Um, so it's a very active area at the moment, mainly because I'm very fortunate to have all these brilliant young people working with me. And um, if you want to look at our papers, uh, you can find them at www.betasig.ac.uk forward slash papers, and you'll find us probably quite a lot of interesting stuff there if you are interested in the data science of stream data. So let's um, go into this a bit more. And um, first of all, I want to remind you of the variety. If you come from stochastic analysis, as I do, there's a huge tendency to think of a stochastic process or an evolving process just as something like a Brownian path. The reality is that um, I don't know how to activate the animation, actually, so on this web. Doing. Anyway, um, there's a huge variety of different streamed data. If I'd known how to animate this, and for some reason I can't at the moment, I would, you would be able to see the Chinese handwriting appearing on this mobile phone app um, and getting translated into characters above. But that's just one of many. Um, one quite interesting one at the moment is just modeling and understanding the evolution of a patient in an intensive care unit where they have these streams of data about them, their blood pressure, their temperature, and many other things, of course, their oxygen levels. And you would like to understand and interpret that stream of data, perhaps to give early warning of some serious signs of deterioration. Um, 
that's one kind of stream. Another kind of stream is astronomical data, but a text is, an, is a stream too, and um, so is an order book in a financial market. We come from one end, but data science certainly hasn't been idle, and nor am I trying to claim that uh, everything has um, can be done by signatures. And two of the, I would think, the most impressive steps forward um, in recent past on the data science are probably natural language processing, BERT, and all these things. And surely, one has to be impressed by what uh, Google have just done with protein folding. Um, but when you stop and think about both of those, they are um, streamed data. I mean, the protein folding is absolutely, you take this string of amino acids and you want to translate it into another path. Now, that I think is something we're very active at the moment. We haven't yet got our first papers, but I think we're, we're very active in it. I think we know where a lot where to go. Um, and that's to push that back into the mathematics. Um, the idea of translating paths is actually quite a sophisticated one, but well understood in the data science. And uh, we're, we're trying to do the same in the mathematics. I don't want to spend too long on this because the time is clicking away. Um, this is just really meant to be a picture of what's going on at the moment, what, where we are. I think if we just focus Focus on the middle section, the current innovation. Um, these are things I haven't really spoken to you about yet. Um, but one of the things we've been able to do with it, this is develop a notion of a neural control differential equation. And this seems like a, a really sound idea. Um, just as a new, uh, Ricky Chen and Co's uh, neural differential equations are a very valuable idea. Uh, and I'll come back to them briefly. Uh, we have a PDE kernel, which is, I think, quite exciting and unanticipated. Um, and also, I think we're doing quite a lot of interesting work in simulating uh, stream data on the basis of data. So there's a really important demand for taking stream data, market data, or perhaps hospital data, and then using that data to produce new data that looks like the old data. This is actually a much more difficult problem than it looks. Um, but signatures offer a pretty principled way of understanding when you're doing a good job. But still, you would very, very much like to have streams of data that look like hospital data um, that you can work on and develop your methodology. Signatures offer a good way of understanding how well you're doing because they offer a better insight into what is in the stream and what statistical properties the stream has and so on through the expected signature right anyway uh we'll, we'll try and move on a bit i want to get on to the mathematics because there's some very particular mathematics that makes this signature a good idea and it's this remark, which I sort of touched on informally, and now I want to take some more time over. There's a, there's a general view, which is basically a wrong view, that the reason we can manage high dimensional systems is because they're not really high dimensional. They live in a lower dimensional space, sitting in the high dimensional space. Well, that might be true, but it's often really not true. And the reason it's not true is because of symmetry. Symmetry is really bad news for data science because what it actually says is that there are there's different ways to rep, different the same event or object gets represented in different ways by applying the symmetry you rotate the seven it's in a different place but it's still a seven now a finite dimensional symmetry like rotation is very easy to deal with. Um, a little rotate, you know, it's a one dimensional, it's a one dimensional sort of fiber of different values, and you augmentation and all that can deal with it relatively straightforwardly. 
But what if your group of symmetries was infinite dimensional and highly nonlinear? Then you understand that whereas you thought you had this surface in the high dimensional space where your data was living and which told you the state, the reality because of the symmetry is you have like a, a fiber bundle and over each of these points, you have many, many different values, all of which represent the same thing. And when you go from one to the next to the next, you see that there is no surface because of this um, fiber. You're taking some section of a fiber, and it's a different one every time. You have many different representations for the same object, which makes learning the patterns much more difficult. And it means there's a very high priority in being able to factor out and remove those symmetries at the beginning in the data rather than at the end in augmentation. And the signature is actually doing that, as I'm going to try and explain. If we look at this number three, we all recognize it as the symbol three. And we can understand that actually there's a curve and if we want to represent it in the normal way, where we give an X value and a Y value for each T, we would see two curves in time, the dotted ones or the solid ones, and these are these two pictures here. But you see that actually, the curve you get on the right, the graphs, if you like, of the X and Y coordinates look fundamentally different according to whether we move quickly at the beginning and slowly at the end around the three, or the other way around. The curve you get on the right, the normal time series, looks fundamentally different according to how you parameterize it. Now, that's actually a real challenge. It means that if you use things like wavelets or something, you're in trouble because the wavelet coefficient is going to be totally different. Different ones are going to be activated. And if you really care, which you do for data recognize the tree, about the order in which the events happen, this makes it even more complicated. So that's actually an interesting question. We have this group of symmetries called reparameterizations. You can, if you reparameterize forwards, you can reparameterize backwards. They are a group. They produce an enormous number of different representations for the same object, this three. How can we find a way of representing the three that's independent of the particular parameterization? You may think sometimes you don't want to get rid of parameterization, and that may well be true, but that's actually an easy point. You don't think of the path as in, you think of time as a variable, not as a parameter. And then you use probably the language of sampling. So you have a space time curve and sampling. And if you resample it at different speeds, you don't want to change your description of it. Um, but anyway, so mathematically, it's an interesting question. How do you do that? How does one describe that tree or any curve come to that in any dimension of space? in a way that doesn't involve a parameterization, that somehow only pays attention to the order in which things happen. The route from Beijing to Shanghai, not the, uh, a particular time schedule for how you go along the route. And it turns out mathematically that, that the signature does exactly this. It precisely filters out parameterization and provides this, as I explained before, a finite, well, graded family of features, starting with simplest ones, that collectively tell you what the path is. But they collectively tell you what the path is up to reparameterization. And here I've written down the stereotyped special set of differential equations we actually use. It's a non-commutative exponential, or path exponential, if you want. We've written down here, a, a sort of universal differential equation. And by looking at the response of this differential equation to our input noise, our input signal, we actually have a complete description of what's going on uh, up to reparameterization. And it's completely insensitive to reparameterization. If I take my path in the interval 0, 1, it just doesn't matter how quickly or slowly I go along it. The final value of S 
will not depend on that. Now, this is powerful. At some level, it goes back to Chen. Um, what has changed over time and with my work and other people's work is the analysis has become much more precise. We know exactly that, that it does characterize S. We know exactly what it means to be parameterization invariant and things like that. Now, that particular differential equation has a solution in terms of integrals. So another way of thinking about the signature is in terms of these integrals. So the idea is we're trying to understand our stream. And we, if it's a mathematical object, we can compute these integrals. And if we compute the kth one, we get more and more complicated. You might want to think a little bit where this lives, because it doesn't, it's not easy to accommodate that, because gamma lives in a vector space. And we're multiplying vectors. Well, vectors don't multiply, really. Um, so where do this lives, it actually lives in a very big space. So if you think of the, the stream itself as being in some finite dimensional vector space, where there's a basis given by letters. So this will be a linear combination of letters. Well, then this will be a linear combination of words, where the words of length k in the letters. And it's not over the square, it's over the simplex. This time is before, this time is before this time. So this object is highly non-commutative and captures order. So this is the signature of a path. The first term is easy, or the north term is one. The first term is simply the intensity of each of the letters. It's just the integral. It's the if the letters were emotions, anger and happiness and disgust, etc., and they can be, then this would simply the first level term would simply be the amount of in anger, <coughs> the amount of disgust, the amount of happiness during the time interval. The second order terms get much more interesting. And the new information they capture is the extent to which the anger came before the depression or the depression came before the anger and actually quickly become more informative. And for many situations, you don't need more than a few to completely understand what's going on. Um, so this is a transform. It gives you coefficients out of the path. And it does characterize the stream. And we can construct real valued functions from these objects simply by taking their projections onto words or linear combinations of words. So this object lives really in a tensor algebra, and we can take dual elements to tensor algebra, and we have real valued functions. So this is a, an interesting model, which is already producing through linear functionals, real valued functions on streams. And they are universal. That's quite easy to see. So they are set up, really, for modern machine learning, for inference and regression and so on. The linear functions of the signature represent and can approximate all continuous functions on the compact set because they form an algebra, actually. So the only new thing here, I think, that I haven't already discussed, is the log signature. So I told you the signature looks like an exponential, a very non-commutative exponential, and it is. But the um, it's got lots of redundancy in it. That's a good thing, because that's why it all, non, all polynomial functions become linear functionals on the signature. But you can take that redundancy out and get a more compact description, and then you would do use the log signature. But when you do that, uh, you need to look at polynomial functions on the log signature, not linear functions. And it's a, it's they, they very naturally move between each other. And there's all sorts of software that will get you between them. Um, I talk quite a lot about the PDE. 
And here it is. So it turns out that taking the inner product of these signatures, which is an easy thing to do conceptually and a terrible thing to do in practice because there are so many terms, um, has a kernel trick. And the kernel trick has been reinterpreted and discovered as a PDE, actually. And that in itself, I think, is really, really interesting and is, again, an example of the data science going back to the mathematics. And you can put those all together um, to do things. Lots of algebra involved. Um, one of the interesting things is the analytic ideas and the algebraic ideas all match up. The algebra is essential. You may not want it, but it is because of the exponential growth. You couldn't handle all these high order terms without some way of organizing the calculations and the coefficients and so on. The algebra is effectively the only way of dealing with that. And it fits into very mainstream, non-commutative, freely algebra stuff and so on. And it's very useful and important for sorting things out. You can go the other way. Here is, no, I actually really want to figure out how to make these run. Um, I want to show you the paths. I don't know if I can go to. No, I can't. That is a shame. Oh, maybe, maybe. No. Um, normally, the presentation allows me to um, to run these animations. I, I, I apologize this time, but actually, these you can see very quickly how the Path, how you can recover these curves from their signatures. You can watch the, the optimization problem simply recovering them. It's quite a realistic thing to recover the paths, including all their depth of 3D from the signatures. Um, so these are the kind of data sets one ends up dealing with, right? These are actually little segments of ship movements. This is uh, the tree that you get by looking at malware or, or indeed just general computer processes, which spawn new computer processes. And you look at the tree of these processes and therefore you get some sort of tree like path, which you can handle using the expected signature. There's a lot you can do like that. Now, I'm running out of time at this point, I think. I'll just uh, briefly uh, show you the sort of things it can do. Using the trees and the kernels, you can handle ensembles of data. In this case, it was crop data. And you can use it, do it in cybersecurity. That's um, also with the expected signatures. Another thing we can do is actually controlled neural differential equations. That's actually quite exciting. Um, so there, the idea is that you want to understand and use neural approaches to find a map from one stream to another stream. So this is an RNN type problem. But what you try and do, instead of actually um, trying to map that function directly using the neural net, you try to model it as, a, as maybe a projection of a differential equation. So you try and think of there being a physics, and then you use the neural net to determine the physics. This fits amazingly well with controlled differential equations, rough geometry, using log signatures. It's amazing how well it all fits together, actually. And it pulls you back into rough bar theory from the neural nets, and it's quite successful as well. I think that's probably a moderately good place to stop. Uh, I, I just think I go to the very last slide. Yeah, I'll go to this slide. And that will be the place to finish, I think. Mathematical Insights lets you do things without lots of messing about. One of the things it lets you do is it lets you write very lightweight objects sometimes. And uh, one of our recent postdocs has just been experimenting, and he has some extremely lightweight uh, image recognition systems, not for every image, but for example, just whether there's a crack in the image or whether there's a fire in the image. And using the signatures to do this directly, he gets very low footprint devices that will run on a Raspberry Pi uh, and are vastly more economical with energy and with uh, computer resource than the normal ones. There are lots of different directions in which this can go. My time is firmly out. Uh, I'm going to stop now. And thank you very, very much for uh, 
having me and I hope you find it interesting. Uh, thank you. <laughs>